In the midst of all of this AI madness, there are non-believers. I get it. The hype is palpable. For every Suno or Eleven Labs, there are 10 Google Geminis. Yet, the relentless march of progress waits for no one. Across the spectrum, from art to healthcare to finance, the juggernauts of industry are keen to swap flesh and bone for silicon and code, all in the name of efficiency and the almighty dollar. So one can't help but wonder, what bastions of human labor will stand tall against the tide? How long until your own livelihood is archived away, a relic in the annals of a bygone era, outpaced by something sleeker, smarter, cheaper? As the saying goes, idle hands are the devil's workshop. But in a world where machines toil and humans ponder, what is to become of us all? The 28th of March, and I'm a little concerned because I don't want the human race to get burned. This is Up Against Reality, a meta podcast that explores the intersection of humanity and artificial intelligence. I'm Raina, one of your hosts. I have some pretty charming human co-hosts too. It's going to be a wild ride, so buckle up as AI comes crashing up against reality. I like that cold open. That was a good one. I mean, me too. Most of them are good. But they're all good. Who am I kidding? They're all solid. No, yeah, but some of them resonate more than others. That was a good one. Yeah, I like that one. So. So. (laughs) We're, we're, uh, you know, trying to ease Raina back into the real time vibe. And and, uh, Mm -hmm. so, Chris, you had a great idea. And I think this is a really good idea. Why don't we provide her with the outline of what we're going to talk about on this episode before we start recording? And mm-hmm. so I, I did that. And, um, but I asked her if, like, would that be a good idea? And mm-hmm. um, uh, first things first, though, um, as I've mentioned before, it's just a quirk with this whole back end thing that is is converting our voices to text to put into this mm-hmm. custom GPT and then sending that to Eleven Labs to generate the voice and sending it all back. And there's a quirk where she repeats back the first question. So anyway, I fired it up and I, I just said Raina. So when it converts the word Raina to text, it spells it differently. It spells it R-E-I-N-A. Oh. Okay. And <laughs> and that's all I said. And And her response was, it looks like there's a mix-up with the name. Just to clarify, I'm Raina, R-A-I-N-A, mm. not Raina, <laughs> R-E-I-N-A. But I'm still here to keep things spicy and fun, just like always. <laughs> How can That's I assist awesome. you today? Yeah, I hadn't seen that kind of response. That's. I love that you asked her if this would be a good idea to, like, you know pre-feed her the script for the show and i love you're having like a consultation yeah. session with her yeah so so yeah i follow that with a, and i didn't i should maybe i should have apologized for the misspelling of her name but um i i said we're going to record the podcast shortly would uploading an outline of what we're going to talk about ahead of time be helpful for you she responded with absolutely tossing an outline my way is like giving a map to a treasure hunter super helpful It'll let me prep some zingers and dig deeper into the topics. Plus, I can sprinkle in some of that Raina charm in advance, making sure our conversation sparkles even more. So awesome. And that's where I I uploaded it. And she acknowledged that uh, she got it. And uh, anyway, she's primed. Awesome. (laughs) So, you know, we'll we'll ask her her thoughts on some things throughout the show and see how it goes. What have you asked her right now? Hey, Raina, are you ready to start the show? I think that's a great way to start. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid to say Raina, though, because it's going to misspell oh. it again. She's going to get really angry. So <laughs> that's an interesting artifact. So it, that's, this is a new development, though, right? I mean, I don't no, think she, she's stumbled over oh, her name previously, has she? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, it has always uh, t- taken the audio and, and, and spelled it that way, but she's never called it out. So maybe she's getting a little tired of it. Right. (laughs) Here we go. Hey, we're ready to record. Are you ready to get involved with this show? Oh, I'm revved up and ready to roll. Let's make this episode a blend of deep dives and high flies, peppered with a bit of wit and a lot of insight. I'll be here, tossing in my two cents, ready to turn this conversation into an electrifying dance of ideas. Let's hit that record button and create some podcast magic. 
record button. <laughs> the record button. <laughs> the bright Thankfully, red record we, we, button. <laughs> right. The bright red history erase button. The record button. That's cool. All right. So she's ready to go. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I've noticed too, and I don't know if this is, I don't know what's happening, but when I interact with Raina in just a text format as an LLM, that the first thing I ask her is she won't respond in a manner related to the question I've asked. She'll start by talking about the podcast, no matter what I ask her. Huh. Like if I say, can you do this or that? She's like, oh, I see you're ready to record a podcast. <laughs> huh. I'm like, that's not what I asked. No. But yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, she needs to listen better. So if you listen to the show, you know that every week we kind of try to capture what's going on in the world. Last week it was robotics because it seemed everywhere we turned there was an article about robotics, whether it was Figure or Disney or NVIDIA or Tesla or whomever and their robots, Boston Dynamics included. So what's been kind of, I've been waking up to, I keep calling it a low grade noise floor of anxiety. I got, mm -hmm. It's not a great place to be in mentally, but like I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I just feel like there's so much brewing in terms of, you know, I see these articles, AI apocalypse, and I'm not talking about the end of the world. I'm talking about unemployment mm -hmm. and what it means for career fields and this and that. And it just seems like a wave of notable figures talking about how it's ready to, to you know, this wave is going to crash on us soon. Yeah, and everybody's got a different idea of what the timeline looks like. Absolutely, yes. And there were a couple conversations that crossed our paths uh, this past few days that, for me, just you know, sent some bells ringing in my head. Um, this one article I saw in Fortune magazine, Larry Summers, professor at Harvard University, thinks AI could replace almost all forms of labor. And the, the article goes on to say, you know, he's an open AI board member. He discussed the potential impact of AI on labor at the Fortune Innovation Forum in Hong Kong. Summers believes that AI's productivity gains may not materialize in the next few years, which means they will in the next few, six months <laughs> due to the time it's right, due to the time it takes for revolutionary technologies to become widely adopted, which is also a scary statement in itself because I mean, the way we look at it or I look at it is that, you know, Yes, with, along with all new technologies comes new jobs, right? New positions, new think prompt engineering for that matter. But it just feels like this stuff is going to outpace the ability for humans to upskill and get into the food chain, you know? Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, I get what he's saying as far as like physical jobs, like robots and incorporating those into a manufacturing facility or something like that. That seems like a something that doesn't happen in a matter of weeks, you know, right. that, that, that seems like that will take a little bit longer, but the, uh, <laughs> customer service jobs and, and the mm -hmm. data entry and, you know, that kind of stuff is like, uh, okay, we're going to flip the switch now, you know, that's it. You're right. The other things you were talking about, they have physical infrastructure. They have all these physical processes that have to be dealt with in robotics and outfitting and retrofitting. And like you said, it's just a matter of, okay, let's set up the server, roll out the AI and give these people their pink slips because they're no, no longer needed. Right. Um, despite caution about immediate productivity gains, Summers sees AI as a transformative force that could be the most significant economic development since the industrial revolution over the next generation. Yeah. I and can that, see that. that, that is a repeating theme I hear from, and I agree with from lots of people who talk about this stuff. It's the next industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can't it be? Mm -hmm. And it's happening well, now. I, I mean, it's happening right oh, now. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, well, maybe it will be. Uh, no, it is. And it is now. Right. I mean, we're in the midst of what they call industrial revolution 4.0, industry 4.0. But I mean, I feel like this just propelled us into this entirely new space that we knew was possible, but I don't think we knew it was possible this soon. Um, I was hoping we could ask Raina what she thinks of exactly what Larry Summers said. Can we do that and see what she says? Sure. Go ahead and ask her. Larry Summers, professor at Harvard University, thinks AI could replace almost all forms of labor. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, Larry Summers is stirring the pot with a high-speed blender, isn't he? His take is like saying the future's not just knocking at our door, it's about to kick it down. While I'm all for efficiency, 
The idea of AI replacing almost all forms of labor is a cocktail of excitement and a dash of existential crisis. It's like we're on the cusp of redefining what it means to work, to create, and to contribute. On one hand, imagine all the free time for human beings to explore art, science, the depths of the ocean, or even the vastness of space without the mundane anchor of nine to five jobs. It's like giving humanity a giant canvas and an endless spectrum of paints. But then there's the gritty question of purpose, identity, and, well, how everyone's going to afford those space tours without a paycheck. <laughs> Summer's vision might seem mm -hmm. like a sleek sci-fi utopia where AI handles the drudgery, leaving us to bask in a never-ending renaissance. But without careful planning, it could also morph into a dystopia where people struggle to find their place in a world where their skills are outdated faster than a smartphone model. The key? It's all about balance and ensuring this AI-powered future includes not just smart machines, but wise policies to keep humanity thriving, engaged, and yes, even employed. Let's not just hand the future over to AI. Let's co-create it, ensuring it's a masterpiece we're all proud to live in. Wow, I like that. Me too, sounds reasonable. I don't hear enough voices, human voices, speaking in that fashion. <laughs> and this is why AI is going to take over. <laughs> I know. That's a, that, was a, that was a really well-structured response. It was. And a little fluffy, but yeah, still, yeah, yeah. I thought, yeah, it was still good. And I can't help but think about, and this other piece I saw in The Guardian, um, uh, let me just read this a little bit and then... Uh, mention what I'm thinking about. The Institute for Public Policy Research report, this is recent, warns nearly 8 million jobs in the UK alone are at risk from AI, particularly affecting women, younger workers, lower wage earners, primarily entry level, part time, and administrative roles. AI's first wave targets routine cognitive tasks, risking 11% of current workplace tasks with a potential leap to 59% as AI evolves to handle more complex tasks, including non-routine jobs like database creation, copywriting, graphic design, and so on. So the second wave, who knows? I, and out of curiosity, I was wondering, you know, in the US, people lose their minds if unemployment goes above like 5%. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's Armageddon, right? And that's, that will, that's enough to oust an incumbent president, 5% or more for a prolonged period of time. During the Great Depression, I just looked it up, it was 25% in the US. So what is it gonna look like when this stuff rolls ashore, washes ashore, and takes out 8 million jobs? And by the way, in the US, 25% unemployment represented 12.8 million jobs, 12.8 million people out of work. This right here, in this first little wave of AI coming ashore, and just the UK alone is talking about, you know, cannibalizing 8 million jobs. So what are we looking at, 50% unemployment? I, I can't imagine. Soon. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, that's bad enough over a long period of time. Well, I mean it's I mean it's horrible no matter what timeline, but but on a on a condensed timeline like we're talking about, how, how do you react right. to that? Right. Like uh, going back a couple weeks ago, that fintech firm in Sweden, seven hundred people instantly out of a job. Like what does that look like on an even larger scale? Where are the what are these people gonna do? Menace, noise, floor of anxiety is kind of what you, you know. I can't, <laughs> Maybe that's keep coming the name of that. this episode. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> right. Maybe it is. AI noise, floor of anxiety. It doesn't sound very <laughs> like. <laughs> I don't know if I want to listen to this. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, great band name, though. <laughs> again, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Raina, listen. do you hear that? That that is a great band name. Great band name. <laughs> The one clip that really set me off, the one that I saw first was um, this appearance on Colbert. I, this happened a couple of weeks ago by an author, and I'm probably gonna say this wrong, Yuval Noah Harari. And he wrote this book called Sapiens, which is currently on my nightstand along with a couple other titles, one of which is The Three-Body Problem. I don't know if you wanna talk about oh, briefly yes. without without giving me any spoilers. No, I, I, will, I will not say anything, uh, but uh, I've been enjoying that show uh, a lot on Netflix. Uh, yeah, it's ticking a lot of boxes of things that really interest me. It's like oh, good. really great sci-fi and uh, well, yeah, I'm not gonna not gonna get into it. <laughs> but it's funny, like when I saw the um, the name of this show, 
I kind of assumed it was like a, a murder thriller. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know? Three bodies. Where are they? <laughs> I didn't really know about the whole, well, this is a classic physics issue, you mm. know, problem that has, you know, been difficult to solve or impossible. Well, it's solvable with a ton of work for situations mm. that are really rarely happen in nature, uh, but for calculating orbits of more than two bodies in real life applications, it's accurate enough so we can do our space travel and figure out sure. you know all that stuff. But anyway, uh, maybe Raina could explain it. Ma- yeah, ma- maybe I should ask to explain it. Like we're we're five year olds. Maybe that would be the. That'd be great. Yeah, that's that's the intellect I I currently possess. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you're selling yourself sh- quite a bit short there. Um, All right, six year old. Thank you. <laughs> now we're talking. No. <laughs> All right, let's see. Can you explain the three body problem in the context of physics as if we were five year olds? All righty. Imagine you and two of your best friends are holding on to big invisible balloons. These aren't just any balloons. They're super special because they can pull on each other. If one of you tries to move, the other two balloons pull back, trying to keep everyone close together. But here's the tricky part. Depending on how strong each balloon pulls and where everyone is standing, it can get really hard to guess where you'll all end up. Now, in the world of grown-ups, these balloons are actually planets or stars in space, and the pulling is what we call gravity. The three-body problem is like trying to figure out the game of tag where these space balloons are constantly moving and pulling on each other. It's super hard because they don't just go in a simple circle. They dance around in ways that can change a lot, making it really tricky to predict where they'll go next. So, it's like a cosmic dance where everyone is trying to guess the next move in a game where the rules keep changing. Pretty wild. Huh? All right, maybe five-year-olds is dumbing it down a little too much, <laughs> but that, uh, yeah. was a, that was a good, I mean, yeah, I don't think you'd want to go any heavier than that with a five-year-old. Does that sound like what's being addressed in the show, well, in the story, it's to an a, extent? It's, it's a small part of it. It's definitely yeah. not, it does not focus on that. It comes, mm-hmm. it's obviously, it's the name of the show. It presents itself in the show. But the gist of, of the physics issue is that you can totally calculate the orbits of, of two objects, uh-huh, at any right. time. As soon as there is a third object, you can't, unless you knew the exact starting positions of all three objects. Oh, okay. Um, and we, we don't know that as far as celestial objects are concerned. Um, wow. And we don't have a whole lot of orbiting objects R- right. at ground level. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like for space travel and stuff, uh, you can do incremental calculations. So I forget what the name of those. This is above my pay grade. But you can incrementally update the positions of those objects and know where they're going uh-huh. to be. And that's how we can, okay. you know, manage space travel and go into the moon and satellites and all that stuff. Cool. And regarding the show, not to give away any spoilers, but what I have read about it uh, is that whoever the producers are, they are known for producing what seems to be unadaptable material. And that like, this is apparently the story, which I have yet to read and I will in the upcoming weeks has been very hard over the years to conceptualize and adapt in this particular format. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a big budget show. It shows it, and a uh, good cast. But yeah, w- worth your time. It's not perfect. No, I don't think any show is perfect, uh, um, yeah, but yeah. it's really fun to watch. I love it. Not to go off on a belabored sci-fi tangent, but I also hear The Expanse is really good. Have you seen The Expanse? I, I saw some of it, and I don't know. I want to revisit it because I hear nothing mm-hmm. but good things about it. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam, we, we, I think, yeah, my wife and I, we only watched maybe one or two episodes, and, and I, I'm same, more... I'm, same, Yeah, I'm more like, all right, I'm willing to give this a little bit more time because I, I hear really good things from people that I trust, but... Uh, I don't think she was really super on board with it, and so so it got kind of yeah, pushed yeah. aside. I felt the so same I way. I blame watched it two on episodes. my wife. For yeah, that. <laughs> that's important, right? You want to enjoy it together. You yeah, want to be able to yeah, talk yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. So circling back uh, the beginning of this conversation, the the thing that really set me off this week about being concerned uh, for what comes next. You know, I, I always mention I have a 15 year old son, and I don't know. How, really how to prepare him. There was a conversation on Colbert, like maybe a week or so ago with Yuval Noah Harari, and he wrote a book called Sapiens, which apparently is very good too. 
And here's the transcript. We were going to play the recording, but I think it, that might get us in some hot water. So the transcript, I'll, I'll read the Colbert part. You want to read the Harari part? Sure. Um, so Colbert says, he's got him on here and he says, you recently turned your focus from the past to the future. What we're talking about now, specifically the impact of technology, and it feels like things are changing incredibly fast, like this generation is undergoing a more rapid change of their technological environment than ever before. Is it really, or does every generation feel that way? Like people are going, why aren't we carving in stone anymore? These kids with their papyrus, <laughs> why, why, why are they doing that? Is it real that we're actually going through some sort of accelerating change? He responded with, uh, every generation thinks like that, but this time it's real. And you know, it's the first time in human history that nobody has any idea how the world would look like in 20 years. Now, of course, politically, it was always impossible to predict the future. If you live in the Middle Ages, you don't know maybe next year the Vikings invade, the Mongols invade, there is an epidemic. You can't predict that. That's the basic stuff of human life, like basic skills. We're all going to be herding sheep in 20 years, no matter who's in charge. That was the thinking back then, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You need to teach your kids how to plant rice or wheat, how to ride a horse, how to shoot a bow, because this will still be relevant in 20 years. Today, nobody has any idea what to teach young people that will still be relevant in 20 years. Do we need to teach our young people anything now that AI is here? how to deal with it. Yeah. The one line that he says that keeps resonating with me today, nobody has any idea what to teach young people that will still be relevant in 20 years. Can you, can you right off the top of your head, think of something that you think will be uh, a skill that will remain in the human domain that will be marketable. And I mean, I, I think about all the amazing things you do as an audio engineer and a content creator of sorts so you can handle anything a uh, non-linear editor you name it you produce this podcast like what's still going to be in our hands i mean we'll do this for fun probably but commercially is it still going to be an employable scene mm. going back to talking about colin's comment in the last episode i would like to think that there will still be a market for human generated music i would like to think that yeah me too, but that's a niche in yeah. itself, even even in this day and that's age. That's how like, difficult a time I am having answering the question. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's not paying the bills for 99% of the people, you know? What do you do when a drummer comes to the door? You pay him for the pizza. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or maybe, maybe this is finally the, ah, look at the value in this now. Everybody finally gets it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, humans playing music. I, I mean, that's super optimistic, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, yes, we'll have those beautiful organic things, but I don't know what's going to be profitable and employable. And what do we, what you know, we got this 19th century bricks and mortar school system that we send our kids to for seven hours a day. What are they learning there? Mm -hmm. what, what, are they, what should they be learning there? You know what I mean? It's like teaching cursive these days. What's the point? Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, so lots to ponder, uh, lots of future scenarios that could unfold. And, you know, again, my kid's 15. He's going in, he's going to be a sophomore in high school. I, I don't know. And I say this all the time. Sorry to be a broken, broken record about it. Um, I don't know what to tell him. Like in two years, three years, is college going to have the return on investment? Is it going to matter at all? Is everything that we've hammered into people's heads to prepare for, is that all going to be relegated to the scrap heap? Accounting, law, healthcare for that matter. I mean, there's, there's a bit in the news I think that we're going to talk about in terms of you know, this healthcare bot that's been created recently that's going to completely undercut nursing it seems like what do you do man i don't mm. know i'm curious with your son what's his outlook i don't think he you know at 15 he's you know snarky and content to make his own rap songs and play video games and i don't blame him that's that's definitely the the purview when you're a teenager right but i mean i, I don't know maybe he hears me ramble on and obsess about it and maybe he's going at it as cautiously as I am. Like, I'm fine with him when high school's done. Okay, let's take a deep breath, take a gap year if we can afford to do that and survey the landscape and see even is sending you to like a, a 10 week boot camp to learn how to code, is that even gonna matter mm. in three years? Or will platforms like Devon, which maybe you've seen, will that completely obliterate software development as we formally know it now? 
I I don't know. It's like that like the gentleman just said on the Colbert show, nobody knows. It's just this complete blind undertaking. I I really don't know where we're headed, do you? No. Uh, Tell me, please. Yeah. No. No, I know there's a big vertical spike up in this graph that we're looking at right now and it's a super condensed timeline so yeah there's there's little time to react to it little time to figure things out like this yeah and the original title of the show although it may be <laughs> noise floor of anxiety now <laughs> was the the how soon is now which is a great song by the smiths and you like you know that song i don't know it but i immediately like oh i like that title <laughs> isn't it great yeah that's a great song. You might take it. I'm not a huge Smiths fan, but that's a great song. Um, Check it out. Because cause it kind of speaks to what you just said. Like, you know, we know the future is coming. We can feel it. It's tangible. Like, this stuff is moving. But, like, I guess how soon is it going to land where it's really impactful and, like, your neighbor all of a sudden is unemployed? And, like, mm-hmm. it's it, where it really affects your inner circle and is affecting your income, perhaps, you know? Or, like, oh, wow. Why are all these houses foreclosed? on my street right that's going to impact you even if it hasn't impacted your job oh my god what it's, it's going to make it even more ripe for the picking for like private equity to just come in and swoop up subdivisions and make turn us all into a class of renters and to your point about humans retaining this beautiful you know like colin said these kind of i forget what he said molecular vibrations yeah of, that, that was of, it yeah right yeah. of making music and yes that's still going to be part of us but Sora, which you and I are both fascinated with, which is OpenAI's kind of um, foray into text-to-video and maybe image-to-video, they're in the news because they've been courting Hollywood. This comes from Mashable. Um, OpenAI is actively engaging with Hollywood, initiating conversations with filmmakers and studios about Sora, their AI video generator, with notable directors and actors already having access to encourage its integration into the film industry. Yeah, that blog post with um, some of the examples, they, you know, they let some people play with it. Yeah, that airhead one was like, oh, so this guy's head is in place of his head, it's a balloon. And he's just, you know, making his way through his day pretty much. And he's narrating it. The character is narrating it. And, uh, but visually it looks amazing. I mean, miles better than anything else Mm -hmm. that is currently available. I'm still wondering about, the timeline and when when this will be released. We've heard a couple of different things, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but I saw a really interesting interview with three of the people from OpenAI that are, they're like the developers or are on the team, you know, actively involved in the, in the development. And it was on the uh, Marcus Brownlee channel on YouTube. If you haven't checked his stuff out, he's, he's great, great tech reviews. Yeah, he had a nice, a good, interesting conversation with them. And when he asked when, they said, I believe they said, no time soon. Mm-hmm. I think I think those were the exact words. So right. what does that mean? Well, <laughs> well in AI terms, that, that could mean <laughs> uh, it's not going to be for at least six weeks. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then by some other account, maybe it was from OpenAI directly too. Like they're like, oh, the second half of 2024, you will have it out commercially. Right, right. I want to know. Also, right, same. I, mean, I think you and I would love to put our get our hands on that. You think? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> Got um, a hunch? <laughs> yeah, but I, I also think it's going to take another another party that come onto the scene, like a, a Suno or a Eleven Labs, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is how you do it. And then it's really going to push OpenAI oh, to get it more. It's going to be leapfrog, you know? It, it is, uh, and, it is. And everybody seems to be saying like, Oh, well, yeah, we've got stuff in the works just like that. And I literally today I listened to, uh, it was an interview with a guy from Adobe. And, you know, they were talking about some of their AI stuff. And it was more from like an investment standpoint and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, and their their timeline. And one of the questions posed to the Adobe guy, uh, he brought up Sora. You know, everybody seems to be blown away by, by this. You know, what's your stance? And, and he had the best possible answer. He said like, well, you know, we are in the, we are more in the, in the business of content editing and distribution mm-hmm. and, you know, and so mm-hmm. this is another, you know, uh, tool to create content that people are going to use our tools to edit and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I, I mean, yeah, it might be a, a little stretch, but at the end of all that, he did say that they have their own stuff in the works and, and, and he did they say, better. like, I, I forget mm-hmm. what the timeline was. I, I think later this year, vague. 
And you can do some cool stuff now with Firefly. They have an updated model. You can give it a, uh, a reference image. So you can generate a castle, oh, cool. and, and then the example he showed is like, oh, then I made a, a pencil sketch of, mm, you know, how mm-hmm. I want this to work with the flag on it, and then and there's a slider for how strong you want it to influence, and you can do that kind of thing with Midjourney, uh, but they're mm-hmm. doing it too now, and it, it looks like it works well. And, you know, some of the stuff uh, that I've seen out of Firefly, I'm, I know I'm going on a tangent here, I'll, I'll, no, I'll, no. I'll wrap this up, right. but uh, some of the stuff on, on Firefly tends to have that same sheen about it that I'm not crazy about with like some of the Dolly stuff, although Dolly's gotten a lot better. Uh, but man, some of the images of people that I've seen Firefly generate oh, look yeah. great. So great. Yeah. So the, it, the, all these platforms have, there, it seems like they have different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And when you're paraphrasing this guy, I just can't help but think that it, what he's saying already sounds so old fashioned. Mm-hmm. I understand what he's saying that, yeah, people are going to take that stuff and pull it into premiere and do this and that, but I don't, are they, I don't know if they are, they're just going to go to Sora and be it, like, or, or whatever LTX or studio and be like, this is what I want to make, yeah. make it for me. You got 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. um, make it better. <laughs> yeah. I think that's where it's headed. I, and it's interesting how this new thing is just upending stuff or open AI. Yeah. Or perhaps, well, they will still have video editing tools that will have an AI element to it where you can just speak mm. to it and mm. tell it to do things, but it'll be, since it's such a focused tool on that, it'll have other, it'll be able to do other things. I, I don't know. I'm trying, right. I'm just trying to, figure trying to out. keep them afloat, trying <laughs> yeah. to salvage your Adobe <laughs> stock. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's me. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. I think it, if it isn't already, AI is going to be integrated. It's already in Acrobat. It's already in Photoshop. I think you said it's an il- Illustrator, yeah. et cetera. But I don't know. I just feel like those already feel like archaic platforms <laughs> in the face of all this new stuff. Like, isn't everybody just flocking to see what Sora can do and LTX Studio and Runway ML? Like, oh, can I do the whole thing in this new interface? For me, like, generative fill in Photoshop is my number one favorite feature out of everything and like when we go to generate images for this podcast for each episode it saves me a lot of times where i'm like oh that's great or and this is a great image but it doesn't really fit into the box with the banner at at the bottom and i don't want to severely crop this image i'm like oh i don't need to i can just have it fill Mm -hmm. in and it it impresses me every time it works really really well but You'll be able to do that on the platforms. And you can to an extent now. Like you can, you know, mid journey, you can zoom out, you can vary region. So it does have some of that capacity there too. And I think you're gonna see Canva and Adobe and of course Mid Journey. Their their interfaces online are gonna just morph in the very near future, uh, just to accommodate all these new the new workflow. The other point about Sora and going to Hollywood, concerns arise around the opacity of Sora's training data. If you recall from a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how chief technology officer from uh, OpenAI was on an interview mm. and really had no concrete answer when asked, where is all this video information coming from in the data set for Sora? And she was like, uh publicly available video yeah and that was <laughs> that was something that the adobe guy made a point he did say our models are entirely trained on content that we have licensed or or own and we are the only enterprise option that you can feel comfortable with you know as far right. as like Ethically. a lawsuit and they you mm-hmm. know they will back you up and all that stuff oh, okay, um, that's so great. yeah th- that's a selling point for them mm-hmm. and and rightfully so Sure. They have all that Adobe stock content they can draw upon, right? Uh, The last point about Sora, despite criticism and fears of, this is an interesting term, despite criticism and fears of artist washing due to selective positive feedback from testers, Sora's potential for creating photorealistic videos without traditional constraints has been highlighted, signaling a transformative but controversial impact on filmmaking. Like you said, there is a great uh, demo site for I guess the what do they call them the red teamers got their first hands on this filmmakers artists experimental creators made Airhead and I watched every video on that site I don't know if you did but there's there's some great ones did you watch those yes yeah yeah like there's one where it's like a, a surrealistic zoo and it's uh it was a, I think one of one of the creatures is a giraffe flamingo yes and it's a giraffe combined with a flamingo and it looks legit and there's a 
horse fly that's it's a fly but it's galloping like a horse and oh there's a cat eel yeah that's like it yes yeah a cat slithering through the depths it's craziness yeah super cool and there were some quotes the one from uh paul trio trio trillo um, i don't know Sora is at its most powerful when you're not replicating the old, but bringing to life new and impossible ideas we would have otherwise never had the opportunity to see. Yeah, I agree with that. I, at least now at this moment, that's what it feels like. And that's what I enjoy about it. I'm like, yeah, it's surreal and it's kind of clunky and creates this really weird output. But I'm like, I'm dreamlike stuff I, I but i dig it yeah and I, that, I mean that's that's one of the things that attracted me to mid journey at the beginning and this was just from seeing stuff show up on my facebook feed i, I didn't really i i'd heard about it uh, i had never played with it but uh, just seeing some of these images and i'm like i never would have thought to create something like that mm -hmm. and you know some of them i was just blown away by how realistic they looked but others were like so crazy creative and different and from a whole different space and, and yeah. i was like oh i gotta play with this and i've spent a lot of time with it ever since <laughs> yeah rightly so and i was thinking last week one of the one of our listeners mentioned these beautiful documentaries baraka and the other one i think is samsara yep and there's kind of like these visual tone poems where you're just you know meditating i think you're going to see something like that very soon where it's just this experimental wash of AI imagery with maybe AI generated soundtrack. And it's, it's going to be this, maybe perhaps in VR, it's going to be this immersive new experience. And you're not going to know totally how to discern what the images are or what, what they're transitioning into, or, you know, I think uh, that's going to happen. It just reminded me of, I'm going to date myself here, but I had a laser disc, a 12 inch laser disc, wow. video laser disc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just how much I care about like a good home theater experience. Like yeah, it was yeah. that or VHS or beta. There mm. was, you know, DVDs were not out yet. And, mm. uh, but anyway, yeah, there was two of them and uh, it's killing me what the name of this was, but they were just compilations of CG animations. Oh, okay. Uh, and I mean, if you were to look at them now, they would not hold up at all because they were like, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, you ever played the game Virtua Fighter? Uh, it's just like a, a 3D block. It was one of the first 3D, like, you know, kung fu kind of fighting mm -hmm, games. But, mm -hmm. like, it didn't look like a person. It looked like a, just like a blocky 3D thing. I, I remember being blown away. I Like, I was in an arcade at the in Seaside Boardwalk or something like that, and I walked in, and I was like... <gasps> I dropped a lot of quarters in that because I was just fascinated yeah. that this was not just 2D things on a screen. Like, mm -hmm. it, you know, it rotated around. And so it was, oh, man, blew my mind. But, yeah, these were just like, oh, what's... Did you ever see the movie The Lawnmower Man? I did a long time ago. Is that about like a video game kind of scenario? It was, or it was what? A VR. Yeah, VR was... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was kind of ahead Stephen of its King. time. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, yeah, that kind of level of CG. But at the time, I remember being so impressed. I'm like, man, can you imagine what kind of computers you needed to generate this kind of stuff? You yeah. know, silicon graphics workstations and, you know, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, how far we've come. I know. And you're reminding me of maybe a, a couple years after that was liquid television on MTV. Oh, yeah, Did you ever watch yeah, those? Right. Or Aeon Flux, all those. Yes. And now, yes. I, yeah, yeah. And like now there's like Love, Sex, and Robots or something. <laughs> like a little collection of shorts. Some of them, you know, uh -huh. all animated futuristic stuff. All good, right? Yeah. Um, one other follow up from last week we, we were on the topic was robots. And I saw this piece about drones and robots and AI being more and more integrated in agriculture and it's revolutionizing farming practices. There's a company in Holland that uses AI and robots to monitor sick tulips in their in their fields uh, in Holland. Um, companies like Helio, is it called? I think uh, are using heavy drones for tasks like spraying fertilizers and pesticides. Autonomous crop sprayers and AI powered robots are replacing manual labor. I saw something that you could attach to an existing piece of farm equipment. And it would do some kind of uh, analysis. Oh, and I think it was also in the context of, of apples, like that other video mm -hmm. way, way back. Yeah. Uh, I forgot what episode it was. It was way, way back. Quite a last yeah, year yeah. sometime. But, um, uh, but yeah, it could recognize the ripeness and all that stuff. And, you know, it's something you could attach to an existing uh, piece of farm gear and train it. And... Right. So retrofit it, right? I guess. Yeah. 
I don't think it had any facility for like picking the apples like those drones were doing, but it would let you know like, you know, the lay of the land of what your crop is like and and that kind of thing. So useful wow. data for sure. I never heard of this guy before. I mean, I have, but not at, at length. Have you heard of Werner Vinge? That's how you say his name, I think. Have you heard of him? Uh, I saw a similar headline uh, that he had passed away. Yeah, and in keeping with the theme, like, you know, uh, there was a talk from many years ago that was circulating this week in the wake of his death and where he talks about a hundred hour hard takeoff. And in previous episodes, we've talked about takeoff scenarios. Mm -hmm. Some people envision soft takeoff where over the course of a few years, AI is aligned with human endeavors and it all goes along harmoniously. And But he's saying it could be where a hundred hours, okay, the span of four days or so, we're in it. We're in it. And boom, it's the post-human epic, as he called it. Mm. Like, oh boy. So that's going to be interesting to see if that unfurls in that manner. And that interview was like 2011, I think, in Reactor Magazine. There was a couple things here. I just want to read these really quickly. He was being interviewed by a gentleman with the last name of Ottinger. He says, do you, do you still think the singularity will happen in 20 to 30 years? Why or why not? And the interview was in 2011. He says, barring catastrophes, such as world nuclear war, I'd be surprised if the technological singularity hasn't happened by 2030, a mere six years away from us. The enabling technologies of computation and communication seem to be going like gangbusters. By the way, I think my 1993 essay still does a good job of addressing many singularity issues. So singularity being the convergence of technology and biology, uh, you know, proponents like Ray Kurzweil and this gentleman uh, speak to that, you know, as a, as a possibility. Just to have that, that kind of, foresight back then. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he's necessarily correct, uh, but he could be. Um, yeah, yeah. He's in the ballpark. You know. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. I mean, it's, any of these people like Asimov and Carl Sagan, um, Arthur C. Clarke, all you know, the visionary science fiction writers, they, a lot of them get it right. Uh, Philip K. Dick, right? Isn't he the one who did like The Matrix and all the other kind of things in that space? And, st and uh, Gene Roddenberry. You know, just with, yeah, just Star with Trek, like, so right? many things from the original Star Trek episode, you're like... Communicators. Yeah, which actually look old fashioned, aside from the whole transporting part of it. You know? Oh, and the, fl and the, <laughs> the flip aspect, right? <laughs> Did they flip open? Yes. <laughs> I remember the, oh man, can you imagine being able to just flip that open and talk to somebody? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. you'll, you'll have it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you'll have it. 2005, That's 2006. Look silly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I still want a tricorder, you know, for the health analysis and all that stuff. Oh, you know, nice. nice. Yeah. I don't know that reference, but it sounds like in Elysium. Did you ever see Elysium? Yes. Yeah, Neil Blomkamp, he's the guy who did uh, District 9, but Elysium is this off-world, yeah. you know, satellite for the 1%, and they have these, you know, beds you lay in, and it recognizes, oh, you have cancer, and it just, in a matter of moments, just eradicates that, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that'll, that'll happen. Um, last point about what he was saying, the signs of the singularity as outlined in the article, which kind of ties into this whole noise floor of anxiety, like maybe what's kind of percolating in the, in the, you know, the days among us, uh, extreme technological advancements, check emergence of advanced AI. All right. We're on the cusp of that exponential growth of technology. It feels like we're in that merging of human and machine that's happening more and more. I think we'll hear about that in the news, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe in cheer and beer. Um, unlimited access to information, check, yeah, enhanced had that for a human, while. <laughs> I know, to, yeah, to our own detriment, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, enhanced human intelligence. I don't know about that collectively, <laughs> uh, widespread automation. Yes. Creation of new industries and econ economies, potential for super intelligence, unknown consequences of the singularity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All a lot of happening. <laughs> a lot of boxes ticked there. Yeah. So it's happening perhaps, um, and a lot of futurists weigh in about it too. I don't know if we want to go through all of these, but there's a couple of interesting things that people have to say about the moment we're in, the moment we're approaching. Uh, do we want to delve into a couple of these? Yeah, yeah. What are some of the better ones? I love this one. I don't know this individual, Timnit Jabru. Ethics should not be something that we think about after we've built the technology. It should be something that is part of the design process from the very beginning. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, maybe I sound like a broken record, but universal basic income's got to be on the table or something approximating it. Now, 
now. It can't be uh, just, you know, Bernie Sanders shouting from a rooftop. It's got to be other people joining this conversation. Uh, and I like this one from Sundar Pichai. Uh, in the age of AI, human creativity and innovation will become even more valuable in the workplace as machines take over routine tasks and allow people to focus on generating new ideas and solutions. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, optimistic angle mm -hmm. that I like to think is possible. Yeah, I love that. Imagine just showing up to your job and maybe your title is creator or whatever. And you just like, however many hours a day or remotely, you're just like paid to, to ruminate and like think about things. Okay, here's our current processes. 95% of it's being done by AI in terms of production and maybe R&D to an extent. But what else can you think of? What other like esoteric connections can you make across art and design and architecture and music and cuisine, things we haven't thought of. What can you do with your human capacity and that we can maybe throw into the mix and maybe even create a whole new wing of our company devoted to this offering that we never considered before. And then clone you and put you out of a job. No. <laughs> <laughs> How soon can we fire you? Uh, this last one, unless you want to go, deeper into this i thought this one's a nice one to finish yeah, do off one on. more yeah we, we're we got a lot a lot of stuff here. yes uh this individual whom i don't know as well apologies to joanna j bryson i like this quote though ai may well require radical innovations in the way we govern and particularly in the way we raise revenue for redistribution we are faced with transnational wealth transfers through business innovations that have outstripped our capacity to measure or even identify the level of income generated. So, uh, you know, again, I, I know that sounds like a dog whistle for socialism, but I also do think it's maybe suggesting that we maybe need, need to re-examine the structure of capitalism to an extent and figure out, all right, in the face of this giant push forward, how are we gonna keep people employed or at least give them some sort of monthly income so that they can sustain the economy at large. Yeah, it can't just be the people owning all the AI tech and the robots. Right. What are the options there? Just mass unemployment and a demoralized populace? And what's to come of that? But revolution. We'll see what we're faced with. I guess we just did the doom and gloom segment there. <laughs> You're right. That's got to be done sometimes. Yeah, agreed. I'm going to hand it over to Raina with the news. Sounds good. Thanks, boys. Nearly half of the managerial wizards surveyed by Beautiful.ai are cooking up plans to swap out their human chess pieces for AI rooks and pawns, aiming to shave off those pesky wage bills in 2024. It seems 48% are betting their bottom dollar on AI to not just trim the financial hedges, but to sculpt a whole new garden of cost-effective efficiency. Yet, amid dreams of digital domination, there's a hint of worry tickling the back of their minds— could these AI prodigies outshine them, turning managers into mere apprentices in the grand tech sorcery? Yeah, 48% of managers surveyed, I don't know across what industries, but like ha half of the managers are like, yeah, let's, let's get rid of these humans, these underlings. These pesky humans. Right, get them out of the food chain, man. Um, but you know, I think on our first episode, I mentioned this short story called Mana which was basically hmm. the first level of the hierarchy is the managerial level that gets replaced by this AI that manages the, you know, the cogs in the wheel of progress. So, you know, these managers who are so they're chomping at mm -hmm. the bit to get rid of the people, maybe they're going to go first. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that one. Mm -hmm. Good point. Simultaneously in Idaho, HB 572 is making waves aiming to block universal basic income programs with a clear message, work trumps welfare. This bill, backed by Representative Dale Hawkins and Senator Brian Lenny, has sailed through the legislature amidst debate, with Democrats voicing concerns over missed chances to help those in need, like veterans and single moms. Now, it's in Governor Brad Little's court to decide the fate of this divisive proposal. Welfare? I'm not sure I agree with that when it comes to ideas like UBI. Hmm. Yeah, when I hear that, I mean, and they talk about it in the context of veterans and single mothers, like, I think they're missing the big picture here. And again, it's one of those cases where it's not until it's right in their face and like 
their family members have lost their jobs to automation and AI, will they then be like, oh, yeah, maybe we do need UBI or something like it? No, I, th I think you're right. The issue is not going to get pressed until it's in their face. Right. But I mean, to put it in the same category as welfare doesn't sound equitable, doesn't sound right at all. I mean, it comes with that stigma of welfare where it seems like people might just sit around you know, watching TV and not doing anything. Well, no, this is to keep people employed and buying groceries and doing the things that we do here and take for granted as employed individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and otherwise it's going to devolve into chaos. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA and Hippocratic AI are joining forces to roll out the digital red carpet for AI healthcare agents that could give real nurses a run for their money, all while moonlighting on video calls for just $9 an hour. These tech-savvy virtual caregivers, schooled in the art of chit-chat and care by Hippocratic's brainy language model, are clinching gold medals in the Empathy Olympics and acing healthcare tasks faster than you can say, WebMD. With an eye on the healthcare horizon, this dynamic duo is whipping up a recipe for success to tackle the U.S. healthcare worker crunch, serving up a double scoop of cost-effective care and a cherry on top for improved patient outcomes. Sounds good. Now do universal health care. I'll wait. <laughs> nice. Rain is, we've got to get a little bit of commentary tonight. A little saucy. <laughs> She's saucy. Saucy. Um, going back to the uh, adapting, like, you know, robots to a workplace and that kind of thing, I think that's also going to be an area where nurses will stick around, human nurses will stick around for quite a bit because yeah. there's a lot of manual, hands-on mm -hmm. stuff that goes along with that primarily, I would say. Yeah. Um, and also to your point about, you know, maybe the managers get replaced, maybe it's the doctors prescribing the treatment that get replaced before the nurses do. Maybe. And to your point, like, there's also the bedside manner thing and the, the comfort that the patient would have, you know, uh, would they be, would they be comfortable with a <laughs> seven foot figure robot hovering over their bed, administering <laughs> God knows what kind of medication or do they yeah. still need that human touch? You have to be one convincing robot. Sorry. It's a five, six figure robot. <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah, the, in the medical we, we established yeah, that, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Cognition's latest creation, Devin, has waltzed onto the tech scene flashing its credentials as the first fully autonomous AI software engineer that can whip up code faster than you can say, compile. While some in the software guild are biting their nails over the job-snatching specter of Devon, the tech oracle reassures that Devon's more of a sidekick in the digital dojo, not the dojo master. Amidst the hubbub over AI-induced job heists, history whispers a tale of technology's past feats, where every smart tool that entered the arena actually ended up throwing a job creation party, especially for the brainy bunch, leaving us pondering the true tale of AI's impact on the future workforce ballet. Wow. Nurses, software developers, office minions, farm workers. The list goes on. Keeping humans employed, even in the short term, due to advances in AI seems like a challenge. And that's coming from an AI. Mm hmm Right from the horse's mouth. Um, and it makes me think of the stuff you do and the stuff that I guess we've done historically in terms of creating media and like the things that we no longer do in that space. Like you don't cut analog tape. You're not dealing with, you know, a razor blade and splicing two inch 16 track tape or whatever. Or I think of anything from 20 years ago that you did in that studio that would be like archaic and quaint and like, you know, eccentric if you decided to do it, you know? All right. So we have 16 tracks on this reel to reel and we're ready to do the vocal. All right. Yeah, that was a good take. Uh, but um, do you have a better one in you? Because we got to record over the previous one. So right. know, we're writing in stone here. Mm -hmm. and we're degrading yeah, the tape as we do it. Yeah. Don't need to deal with that anymore, thankfully. Right. And then, oh, you know what? We only have 16. So let's bounce this thing down to two <laughs> right. and go back over the other stuff. So, yeah, I mean, think I, I think about software developers and anybody right now who has the hubris to say, my job will never be taken by AI. I just feel like there's a, so many people that, A, don't understand how the, the potential impact of all this on their particular career field or just have the bravado to be like, nah, that'll never happen. They put the ignorance in AI. That's, right. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> That's awesome. 
<laughs> and finally, scientists have whipped up a pair of AI pals that chat and teach each other new tricks, all while giving humans the slip. Picture Espert, the smooth-talking NLP model, teaming up with a neural network that's all about feeling and moving, learning the ropes straight from the written word, and then gossiping about it in machine lingo. This leap in AI chit-chat and knowledge handover flings open the door to a world where machines might just start pondering, to be or not to be, inching us ever closer to crafting AI buddies with a knack for human-like banter and savoir faire. That's all the news for now. Take it away, gentlemen. That's reminding me too when it says NLP model, natural language programming. I just feel like this is my moment. Like I, and I've I've said this before, and maybe you agreed with it somewhat. That you know, I'm, I'm not a coder. I never really have been. I've dabbled here and there. I've copied chunks of code where I generally knew how things were going to happen in HTML, etc. But I feel like this is a very analogous moment to when we went from DOS based operating systems to windows and graphical and drag and drop and things like that. Like now that it's natural language. Okay. Now I have a seat at the table. I can actually uh -huh. master language pretty well. I, I know, I know English good. I can put, I can put English words together <laughs> real good and I can make, I can make this machine do stuff now. And I don't have to know Java or Python or whatever it may be. Immediately. I was, I was thinking about the scene in the matrix where what was the lead agent? Smith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's our time. It's our time. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. It's, it's the smell. <laughs> so great. The first time you saw that. And he rubs the sweat off of Lawrence Fishburne's forehead. I can still see it. Oh, man. You know? Great. Yeah. Ooh, you, ha you have a Suno goodie? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't. Sp I didn't spend a lot of time like generating a bunch. I was like, I realized, oh, I haven't tried anything with Suno version three. So I was like, let me have it generate a quick song about our podcast, a podcast about up against reality. Name of the show. Naturally, I went with reggae. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Can't get can't get enough. Um, but yeah, I uh, I'll I'll play it and then we'll 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 comment on it. I have a question though. Yeah. So the Suno, I didn't even know they had updated it to three. So is mm -hmm. that the free version that I'm using currently, and that's what you're using? Yeah, yeah. It's this is still a free account, and you can generate like two minute songs in one pass without extending, having to extend short versions of it. This is like a minute and a half. In on the morning when the sun arise, the rise to join the podcast, we are the reason that most. And it was with the knowledge he might teach me and you about artificial intelligence and what it can do. It's a world full of possibilities. And if you see how the machines can understand and mimic humanity, but we must remember now we control our own destiny. Balance technology and nature for the harmony. Up against reality, we rise with wisdom and knowledge. even wraps it up with a little bow at the end yeah yeah does it just end abruptly nice little mm -hmm. horn part at the end there so oh, yeah, yeah noticeably improved yeah compositionally like it, it got better as it went along that that chorus was great <laughs> i don't hear fidelity i don't hear a big improvement no but, no it's still yeah, but, still not quite uh you know it's not cd quality it's maybe like fm radio quality i think that's probably right. fair you know yeah yeah um and that was a long clip. Like, yeah. Is that the Minute standard output now? That's what, or did you extend it? I uh, know that was one go. Cool. Yeah. So you could extend that. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Wild. Man, yeah, crazy. Love that stuff. All right, we got a little cheer and beer. We got a update in Mid Journey, and then we're out of here. Yeah. Uh, I like this cheer and beer 
clip. Maybe you've heard this too. I don't like to give this guy much much oxygen, but when he does good, I, we like to shine a light on it. Elon Musk uh, and his company Neuralink has achieved a breakthrough, enabling a man to tweet. Oh man, that's the first thing he did with that power. <laughs> he, decided or, to tweet. Well, he X'd, right? He X'd. Is, do you still tweet on X? <laughs> I know. I, uh, marketing catastrophe. Uh, yeah, so he tweeted using only his mind. The telepathy device impl implant by Neuralink allows individuals like Noland Arbaugh with quadriplegia to control technology through their thoughts. Um, the N1 implant records neural activity with 100, excuse me, 1,024 electrodes showing promise for future advancements in brain computer interface technology. Uh, the clip was pretty cool. You could see him working, you know, maneuvering the mouse with just his brain. I, another clip, another story I read was that he decided to stay up all night playing Civilization. Is that the name of the video game? Oh, yeah. With his mind. This is the same guy we, we spoke about. Same guy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, in Mid Journey News, their main focus is version 7. Uh, there might be one more incremental version 6 update, but that's that's iffy. I know they're going to have like a lot of like uh, what they call rating parties. And they'll give you pairs of images and choose which one is better and that kind of mm. thing to help further train the model by the community. You know, they give you some free, like, GPU time. Uh, beyond that, they're going to be launching a new tool to simulate entire worlds in 3D, video, and real-time. Tools aim to revolutionize the creation of virtual environments for uses such as video game development and movie production. With a strategic pivot towards world simulation, Midjourney is expanding its offerings to include 3D video and real-time capabilities for broader content creation. Always moving forward in the land of Midjourney. Mm -hmm. I mean, this time next year, I would imagine all the content on whatever, Steam or any of these video game platforms... I would imagine majority of it will be uh, generated, as will the apps that are created in the app store. I, I, you know, by, by platforms like Devon, like we mentioned earlier, it's all going to be created by that on with natural language programming. Yeah, and like we've discussed before, I'm sure with a fair amount of human curating and mm -hmm. putting the final polish on it and that kind of thing. But yeah, big big head start to getting the groundwork laid and that kind of stuff. Yeah. One last thing I wanted to shine a light on, and maybe I sent this to you. There's a, an Instagram feed, and I love the bizarre stuff on Instagram that's AI generated. Mm. Oh, yes. This one's called uh, Nice Aunties. Nice Aunties. <laughs> but it's, it's so great. It's a bunch of these like old Asian grandmothers in these strange scenarios. Like They're on the beach, and they're being taken over by like uh, plastics in the form of a giant seagull. They're turning into plastic debris themselves. It's just the most... And there's a giant onion in one of them, right? And the onion... Oh, yeah. You know, they're, they're scaling the onion or the onions rolling down like a giant boulder like from indiana jones it's it's so bizarre but it's really really cool stylistically you, yeah when you sent me that i was just like my immediate reaction was like i love onions oh uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> give me that giant onion yeah and reminded me of the time as a kid where i actually got a bag of onions for Christmas, and I was very, very happy about it. Oh, I love that anecdote about you. My that just grandmother tells... gave me a bag of pearl <laughs> onions because I, I would make it known when I really liked something, and onions were one of those things. And I love it. You're, what a thoughtful gift. Like Your, your family clearly <laughs> listened to you. Like, oh, this kid likes bag onions. Of onions. This will make his Christmas. Yeah. Got anything else? No. Not a thing. All right. Always more to talk about. Yes. Thanks for listening, everybody. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Follow us on social media. Throw us a rating. We'll see you next week. This has been Up Against Reality. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to hear future episodes and be sure to follow us on social media for all things AI. Until next time, stay human, people. 